Hey everyone, Dom here, and it's time to review another self-published fantasy masterpiece. So this masterpiece that I'm talking about is Voice of War by Zach Argyle. This is book one in the Threadlight trilogy and it recently placed fourth overall out of 300 books in the SPFBO competition run by Mark Lawrence for self-published fantasy books. So the Threadlight series is set in a world of magic. People have magic in their blood and you can tell pretty much from birth if they're going to grow up to be able to use magic based on the colour of their eyes. They will be either sapphires or emeralds and those who do not have those green or blue eyes will be unable to use magic. In this story we follow Chris who is a high general in the army. At the start of the story he and his wife are about to have their first child. This comes at a time when he's heavily involved in an operation to track down and stop a group called the Blood Thieves. These are a group of criminals who are kidnapping magic users and draining their blood to use as a drug and potentially to try to pass on the magic powers to the person who is injected with this blood. Chris and his team are having a real hard time trying to get to the bottom of this group of Blood Thieves and that's leading to some internal conflict with the other high generals who Chris serves with as they battle for control of the operation and the extra status that it gives them, especially if they were to be successful in stopping the Blood Thieves. Meanwhile, we've got Laurel, who's a messenger for a group of elders in a hidden city in the middle of the forest, and she's out on a mission when her path crosses with Chris. This leads to all sorts of revelations, including one that could bring down the very fabric of the city Chris lives in. So starting off with the world building, and I really liked what we had here. The world itself was given to us in little snippets. We were left to explore it with the characters rather than having info dumps telling us everything that the author wanted us to know. This really worked for me because it meant that we were able to learn about the place we were in and really get a feel for it and then move on to the next place and start getting a feel for that without feeling that we really had this giant world with so much for us to explore and knowing that we were never going to be able to get around to all of it. Parts of the world that we did see, I thought were well planned out, they were reasonably well detailed without going too much in depth, and they gave us a good picture of the place that these characters were living, both in terms of the geography and of the political and social situations as well. As well as the people, we also get introduced to some of the wildlife of this world, most notably the chroma walls, which are kind of like normal walls in appearance, but with two tails where we would expect to see one. Laurel is a character who's heavily involved with these chroma wolves. She has a close affinity to a particular wolf who is at a nursery in the city of Zedalum, which is this, uh, this kind of hidden city in the middle of the forest. And that comes into play in the story without kind of ramming it down our throat. It's almost kind of a subtle part of the storyline and I quite liked the way that that was done. And I am expecting to see more of that actually in book two, especially because the cover of book two does have one of these chroma wolves as kind of one of the focal points of the artwork. So I'll be interested to see kind of why that is and how much importance the Chroma Walls start to have as the story progresses. The key part about the world, of course, though, is the magic. So the magic users are called Threadweavers. Everyone has these blue or green eyes. They are kind of referred to as sapphires or emeralds. And the magic allows you to either push or pull. So to put this into context, this isn't really about kind of just moving objects around. I'm sure some of that does happen, but it's more to do with, I guess, moving yourself around. So people will run very fast because they're able to push themselves away from objects or pull themselves towards objects. Similarly, they can uh, run up walls by kind of pulling themselves to the wall or pushing off from the floor, for instance. So it almost seems like whatever the activity it doesn't matter whether you're an emerald or a sapphire, whether you can push or pull, you kind of uh, just do the opposite. If you're an emerald, you do the opposite of what a sapphire would do and so forth. So while both emeralds and sapphires do kind of have their own specialities, the other one will be able to a degree to perform the same tasks, at least for the most part of what we see in the story. So I quite like the way that's done, but it's not just everyone's the same, everyone's a little bit different. and. I guess over time you've got the people who use the magic, the threadweavers, have 
kind of started to evolve and learn from each other and find different ways to accomplish the same thing. So I thought that was quite interesting without actually being explored in the actual text. That's just the way it got me thinking about it. I thought it was quite interesting to show that with a couple of different people. You don't have kind of uh, these scenarios where you're thinking this person can't do this because they're not a sapphire or they can't do that because they're not an emerald. So I quite like the way that the magic was used in the story overall and uh, it leads to some interesting scenarios where you do have those kind of bits that only certain people can do and the people with a different eye colour essentially have got to find another way around things. Another thing that I really liked about the magic is it very definitely shows you uh, kind of the cost of the magic, not only in kind of how it makes you feel as you use it, and if you use too much, you get uh, people who, who do definitely show that they are tiring because they've been overusing the magic, or in general, if someone has been overusing magic consistently, they start to get what's known as thread sickness. And you do also see that this has its wider consequences of people can actually die as a result of using too much magic or they can have permanent uh, kind of consequences on their body. One kind of element of this is um, people who are older, older magic users are not really kind of known. Without going kind of too explicitly into it. The book does detail a passage almost of older people. They have uh, the gale and there's uh, terminology like gale take you and, and things like that. So there is something that happens. It's an event that happens. We're not given the full details of it, but it does show that you do have the consequences, especially as you get older, you do have the consequences of using the magic. One of the other things is that it does show up. So the magic is kind of in your blood. So when you use magic, it does show up in your skin where you can see your veins. Um, these people will have kind of the blue or the green almost shining through their skin where their veins are as this magic and the thread travels through their blood. So that was quite interesting. There's no kind of escaping it. You can't very well hide that you are a magic user unless you are literally not using magic. But then you've also got to kind of shield your eyes, which we do see a little bit of in the book. But also you can't use magic discreetly because it's too easy for people to tell by looking at your skin whether you've actually been weaving these threads of magic or not. So that's quite an interesting element I thought and it does come into play a couple of times, particularly with Lauren who with all of these kind of elements and the consequences of it, she is probably the the biggest example. She's kind of borderline addicted to thread weaving. So she's constantly holding it. She doesn't know that she's holding it. She almost does it just on instinct. And people are occasionally pointing it out to her and saying, you need to let the magic go, kind of give yourself a rest from it basically. And then when she does that, she's described as notably feeling different. It's almost like a part of her has been taken away and the world doesn't quite seem as crystal clear as it is when she's holding the magic. So there's various consequences of using the magic as well and I really really liked the way that they were explored and described to us as kind of case in point rather than just the book telling us what the consequences of magic were. It was, it was a good example of what everyone always talks about with the show and not tell. So the other thing that you get with the magic is occasionally you'll have people who will try and make a conscious effort not to use magic, not to do any thread weaving, because they want to essentially attempt to prolong their lifespan. Which makes it even more meaningful if these people within the storyline then are seen to be using magic because you know at that point what the consequences are and you know the decisions that the person has made and you also know the reasons why they are now going against those initial decisions. So it's another way of showing us that the stakes are really raised at this point and I liked the way that was done, I liked the way that was given to us rather than it just being almost a standard way of telling us yeah the stakes are really high here something's about to go down. It's just a really nice way of showing that to us and I really appreciated that rather than treating the reader as, uh, as, as a bit of a child. It's letting us 
see these things and decipher them for ourselves. Moving on to the characters and there are three main point of view characters. There's a couple of side characters who get the odd little point of view passage but our three main characters are Chris and Laurel and then at a good portion of the way through the book we get a third character who is Alvarax and I'll start on him because there's kind of a little bit less to say to be honest but I didn't really like Alvarax and I think this is largely because to be honest there wasn't really enough time for us to get a proper look at his character. It almost felt like he was added as an afterthought because of the way that he was uh, kind of given to us probably a good 60 or 70 percent of the way through the book is where he first came in and there's no rule for instance that says that an author must introduce all of his characters at the start of a book and that would be a bit ridiculous if someone were to do that but it just seemed a little bit odd having this character kind of brought in so late in the book who's supposed to have such a high impact and I imagine that he's going to have more of an impact in the second book than he did in the first one. For me though it, it just didn't work and I really do think it was just that he we didn't have enough time to get to know him compared to Chris and compared to Laurel who we'd already kind of got into the heads of um, where we didn't get that opportunity with Alvarax. Chris as the main character of, of the book is the one that we really do get into the head of however and I thought he was really well written. He's He's a general in the army, but he's not just a soldier. He's probably more than as a soldier, he's portrayed as a family man. So part of this is obviously because he's having a child at the start of the book, but also we get to see the actual family side of Chris. So he spends actually quite a bit of time in the story with his wife. And that's a little bit, especially for the character Chris is, I think that's a little bit unusual. So he's quite quite refreshing really to see that in a fantasy story. This does lead to some moments where you'll often find in fantasy you get people who will put family above everything and it's, it's kind of family first and then uh, I don't know loyalty to to your ruler for instance and your country second but again this is a good example of the showing rather than telling. We really see that this is the type of person that Chris is through the decisions that he makes and the lengths that he goes to to protect his family above all else. And that's definitely one of the highlights of the story for me is just the way that he was written, the way the interactions between uh, him and his wife and his mother and all of those around him went, especially once that kind of immediate family became three when they had their child as well. For Laurel, I did like the character, I thought that again she was well written, we got to see her motivations, we got to kind of understand them through the way that she was feeling and reacting to the world and what was happening around her. I think the most kind of interesting aspect of her story for me is this real affinity that she has to the magic and the kind of borderline uh, thread weaving addiction that she's got so we get to see the effects of that and through that we get to see more than anything how the magic works especially with some of the things that happen later on in the book we get a real feel for how magic affects people but most notably of course the people who can actually wield it so she was a really interesting character for me and I really liked the way that she was kind of a typical character kind of headstrong late teens who, who obviously knows better than the elders and uh, will will go against what the elders say because she's got her eyes set on a certain path that they don't want her to go down but she wasn't a typical character in the way that she went about it and the way that she reacted and the way that she was shown to feel as she was going through some of these events. I really liked the the writing of the characters overall including many of the side characters. I thought that they were really really well written. It was definitely one of the high points. The magic system as one and the characters as two within this book for me. With regards to the plot it was maybe a little bit on the basic side but you don't always need a complex plot. And this book really shows where you can have a relatively straightforward plot but still weave a bit of complexity into it and you can definitely keep the story fresh and intriguing for the readers. 
So there are a few little twists and turns in the story here. Probably what I would say are the main two. One of them I did get kind of uh, relatively early on and the other one I didn't get at all. So I liked how it wasn't just here's a little twist but I'm going to make it really easy for you or the opposite of that and here's a twist and you're never going to expect it, it's just going to completely blow your mind. It was a nice mix, a nice blend of both of those extremes on that scale and it wasn't just kind of thrown in for the sake of having a twist as well. I think it, it was weaved nicely into the story when both of these elements came up. What you're given at the start of the story as the main issue and where you see the main conflict coming from is the blood thieves and that almost takes a back seat when some of the other things are happening in the story. It's definitely an important part and uh, you could say it's the catalyst for the main part of the story. Uh, it's definitely that the people who are involved in the blood thieves part of the story are involved in the wider scheme of things but that's unveiled to us kind of piece by piece as we go along without it being just a case of you know we're gonna throw everything wide open suddenly in the middle of the book it's a plot that just nicely develops as we go along and as we start to learn a little bit more and start to think a little bit ahead of ourselves the book will either rein us in or it'll encourage us to move along those pathways a little bit further. And I thought it was really well done and really nicely written to allow that without making everything into a guessing game or just to try and throw us off track at every little opportunity. So looking at an overall summary then, as you can tell, I really enjoyed the book. I rated it four stars out of five and it's definitely a new favorite and one that I'm really looking forward to get into book two for because I want to see where this story goes, I want to see where the characters grow and I want to see more development and more exploration of this interesting world that we've been given. In terms of the scoring mechanism, overall enjoyment then 17 out of 20. There always can be improvements but I really did enjoy where this story took us and I thought it was really well done. The world also a 17 out of 20 because once more there was some really interesting magic, there was some good backstory that we were being given here and a nice bit of geography, although we didn't get to see a vast amount of that, the key thing for me was the magic and the way that it was explored and the amount of depth that we went into without it being kind of rammed down our throats. So the characters, I've said I really liked the way that Chris and Laurel were written, Overall, I don't think there were too many characters, but the ones that we got I thought were really good. So this one was 16 out of 20 for me. If you had a little bit further exploration of a couple more characters, or especially Alvarax as one of the main point of view characters, that would have bumped up the score slightly. But 16 out of 20 is based on some really good character work for a small number of characters. The writing for me was 7 out of 10. No real problems. I've picked up a couple of little issues uh, just on the kind of grammatical side that I feel like an extra pass at proofreading hopefully would have sorted out. But overall, I was at home with the writing. It was really easy to get into and gave me no issues with uh, clunky passages of text or dialogue or anything along those lines. So absolutely a good job there. Pacing three out of five. There were some areas that were a little bit slower but nothing that dragged at all, but at the same time there was nothing that kind of really flew past at a frenetic pace. There were a couple of little battles and chase scenes and things like that, but they were well balanced out with the rest of the book. As discretionary points, I gave two out of five. There's a nice cover for this one, a re-release, but I do like the cover that we have for the book now. There's also a nice map which I did actually miss in the Kindle. Obviously a Kindle isn't the best for having maps in a book, you can't really display them to their kind of full potential. So that's one real kind of downside about reading fantasy books on the Kindle. However, the map that we had gave us everything that we needed. It was quite a nice looking map as well, which always helps. But I do like it when a map is provided in a fantasy story. Add that all together and it's 77% for Voice of War, which is a really decent score up towards the top of the list in equal 29th of my all-time rankings. So a really good book, a really enjoyable book, and it's definitely easy to see from reading this why it was a finalist in the SPFBO competition and why it ranks so high. Out of those 300 books coming fourth, it's a really, really good achievement. 
And without having read the three books that finished above Voice of War in the competition, I wonder whether I would have ranked it higher. But if there were three books that were better that year than Voice of War, I can't wait to read them as well. So there we have Voice of War by Zach Argyle. Definitely recommend reading this if you get the opportunity. We've got a really interesting world and magic system and some very well developed characters. I loved the character work that we saw here. It's amongst the best that I can think of for specific character portrayal. So really happy to have picked this one up and I can't wait to get on to book two. Let me know in the comments below if you've read this or if you're looking forward to reading it. I want to know your thoughts or your expectations for Voice of War. Let me know if you've read Stones of Light as well and see whether book two is as good as book one because I'm interested in finding that one out for myself of course. If you like this video give it a thumbs up, hit subscribe if you haven't already done so and the little bell notification of course lets you know when I release future content. I'll see you in another video soon but until then as always take care of yourselves. Read some good books. See you later.